cool. I guess uh, might as well just get started then. Oh, first of all, I guess in general, what is what draws you to the type of music that you make? Where do you start when you're writing a new, you know, a new song, a new album? What exactly is the sort of inspiration for you from the beginning, if that makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> but it's, I can't answer it really because it's just, it's a, <laughs> where, where does inspiration come from? Um, and that's sort of like um, a huge question. That's an eternal question for all of mankind, right? <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It just um, ideas come from a mysterious place and then I pursue them and it's never the same place. It's not like mm. I go to do this one thing and then an idea comes. It's sure. Uh, yeah. One thing that I really like about your your stuff is that you you've experimented with a whole bunch of different genres or adjacent genres and uh, a lot of different production styles and stuff over the years. And uh, I guess the w the way you see your career right now, what do you feel like you have left that you haven't dipped your toes into musically? Mm -hmm. um, well, everything. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've just done kind of my thing, which is fine. I've not, yeah, I, I'm not, I've never really tried to do genres. In mm. fact, maybe the opposite. I don't want to make anything that's in any distinct genre. And when people who don't know, people are like, oh, you're a musician. What kind of music do you play? I'm always like, ugh, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I yeah. know what it's not, but it's, I'm not trying to do a type of music. Anyway to answer your question it's i want to just keep trying as many different creative pursuits as i can i don't want to close the door sure yeah yeah um as far as your your lyrics um i've always wondered where how you construct your songs do you start with the lyrics do you start with a melody do you start with uh instrumentals and build from there because it seems like they're all sort of intrinsically related, but not in an obvious way. You get what I mean? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I think they often grow together. Mm -hmm. There's some back and forth. I don't start, I don't have like a solid method. It's it's also intuitive. It's hard to like break down the process of how an idea begins and how it becomes. It's like I'm in it and it's very hands-on and I'm like f fussing this way or that way, just like, many other art form, I think it's the way, it, like, how do you, how does a painter make a painting? They, they pay attention to it as it goes and they keep working on it until it's feels right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Is it, is there anything you've ever written that, I mean, I'm sure this is true because you've written so much over the years, but is there anything you've ever written that has felt like it shouldn't like you didn't want to release it in the end or like yes. you didn't want to. Yeah. What, what, uh, what qualifies that for you? Well, all of it really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's always, that's a, a kind of a, a part of art making or music making that uh, I don't know if it gets talked about that much, but it's that tricky part of knowing when to call it good. Because some people get hung up on like trying to make a thing perfect and then they just work on it too much and then it kind of dies. It becomes sterile. That's common. Or some people <laughs> on the other end of the spectrum just release a big uh, sloppy blob <laughs> and that's not good either. So yeah, it's the fine art of like knowing when is good enough. Mm. And it's very much like uh, a feeling it's like okay but yeah you asked if I ever don't want to release a thing there's always a little bit of a feeling of that like oh it's not good enough I'm gonna regret this but it's time like this if I were to keep working on it I would kill it so mm -hmm. yeah it's always kind of a leap of faith to just say this is it it's good and release it yeah yeah for sure is it is there anything you still have from like years ago that you haven't taken that leap of faith with that doesn't hasn't felt ready yet yeah lots of stuff mm -hmm. uh, i have yeah the archives have plenty of things that just were like that's that's crap 
Uh, that's not, <laughs> nobody needs to hear that. I did just release this box set that comes with some downloads of, um, I really dug deep and was like, okay, I'm going to release this thing. And there's some not great stuff in there, but I felt like it was sort of me pushing myself to the fringes of my comfort of like, okay, if people really want to know what the, what's in the garbage can, then here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's not, that's not very, not a very good way for me to promote my box set. <laughs> <laughs> Just what's in the garbage can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I suppose all your your finished albums are all in there as well. Yep. Yeah. 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 So this is uh, I've, I've wondered about this too because a lot of artists when they've reached you, you hit like twenty five years about of of making music of of releasing music and uh, you've, you're now putting out all the microphones albums as a box set and what what does that when you look back at your old work at like the first few microphones albums how how does that feel to see that stuff and like see where you've come does it like I know there are some artists who completely regret their early stuff and feel like, oh, I, I've definitely evolved and changed. And there are some people who, who see it all as a, a big part of their body of work. But I don't know where, where you fall in there. Yeah, more in the second version. I, I feel like it's all it's all regrettable and it's all necessary. I don't know. I can't I can't I feel like it's kind of futile to regret the past because um, it's part of who I am now and it's fine. I mean we all have lives like that where we all are just growing and making mistakes. So it's fine. I can own it. And it doesn't feel any particular big way to look back at those albums because for me, they've never really been gone. They don't seem distant. They've just been like on the shelf this whole time, a part of the makeup. And it's just like part of this ongoing project that I'm still in the middle of. For sure. Yeah. Um, you, you sort of hinted in the promotion of the box set as well that this would, I mean, you said you said openly that some of these albums won't be repressed after this as well. And that yeah. this might be towards the end of producing stuff as the microphones. And you've sort of, you've come back to the microphones name in the last couple of years, but you know, it hadn't been since 03, right? I guess, I guess a couple of singles in there, but that you, you'd done stuff right. as the microphones. What, uh, why do you see this as, as like a time to kind of close that chapter? Well, the last record I made, Microphones in 2020, was sort of an experiment in looking back at, at this chunk of like five, six years in my early 20s, where I made these like five or six or seven Microphones albums. Uh, so yeah, from with the perspective of time of 20 years or whatever, I I made this sort of autobiographical song slash album thing and it just seemed like a natural like bookend it's uh it's a artistic project that is has reached its natural conclusion it doesn't i mean it's just a name like it's what whatever thing i make next it will be the same it's just me making albums or paintings or whatever it is i'm working on so there's it's a little bit absurd because it's just this name, but that's also what microphones from 2020 was kind of exploring. Yeah, the answer is I don't plan on using that name again. It's all sort of neatly boxed up with a little ribbon around it, and it's time to move on. Yeah, literally neatly boxed yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, so what about the name Mount Erie? Is that mm -hmm. is that you said whatever name you might use next or what you might what endeavors you may take is Mount Erie still in the future for you or are you going to take a different route? Oh, I hope I don't take a different route. It's so annoying to have to talk about my band name all the time. So <laughs> probably yeah, I'll just whatever's simplest. Right, right, true. Um, in in general, I mean I kind of I kind of brought this up already, but you, you've put out so many albums, so many, you know, uh, versions of your albums and stuff over the years. You're a very, you know, prolific compared to a lot of artists, I would say. Um, what happens when you don't know what to do next? What happens when you hit a, a writer's block? Does it does that happen often or do you know how to deal with it? I don't try and force it. I think it's fine to not produce. Yeah, like you said, I've produced lots of stuff, so I don't need to like squeeze more into the world. There's plenty for people to pay attention to and I'm more focused on um, my own happiness and fulfillment <laughs> yeah. rather than, yeah. but no, I. I'm always working on something, whether it's for like lots of people to see or just for my own enjoyment. 
it's it never turns off mm, yeah in a similar vein is it do you ever think about critical or even fan reception to your work like is that something that that goes into it when you're making it because you have a very dedicated fan base and you tend to get critical acclaim a lot as well for your work but um does that ever factor into what changes you might make in in future stuff i try really hard to ignore those things yeah yeah it's yeah. it's important for like the integrity of the art but also just like my own mental health try and just block it out yeah even though yeah it's really nice it's all very positive it's not like I'm trying to block out trolls who are hating me, but I would block that out too. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's true. I mostly just try and block it out because mm. whenever I do like try and wrap my mind around it more, it, it, it's not, uh, doesn't help. It doesn't help me in my like day to day life to think about what do I want to do next to think like, somebody has a tattoo of this elephant or whatever it's um it's just weird it's just it's flattering and weird and it doesn't yeah doesn't help me you've uh, i read an interview with you recently where you talked about or i guess it was it was a transcript of uh a pamphlet you would hand out to fans when they'd ask you for autographs i read this recently <laughs> uh -huh. and uh yeah and i, I found this fascinating because a lot of a lot of people will you know, if they don't want to sign autographs, we'll simply just be like, you know, I'm not going to sign an autograph and walk away. But you seem to put a lot more time into explaining your <laughs> reasoning behind that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. What, can you talk a little bit about that and explain what like that barrier feels like to you between fan and artist? Sure. Yeah. That's, I made that little pamphlet. I think I made like a hundred of those as a sort of an experiment. Cause I always have had very weird feelings about being asked to sign a thing. It's, to me, it seems so absurd. I can I can relate to the impulse uh, of somebody being like I want to make this moment of our meeting special and I want to commemorate with this like social ritual that we all do but to me it just seems like what you want me to write my name <laughs> on that thing that seems so silly um can't you just remember that we're like face to face but um yeah so I wrote this like essay and I thought it would be nicer instead of just saying like no and making the person feel bad and walk away embarrassed to give them like this thing that like elaborated on my complex feelings but and I took them on tour and I tried it at shows but it didn't feel right people were like weirded out by it they their feelings were hurt they're like oh man he really hates autographs oh I'm such an idiot for asking oh no I displeased him and it just like it wasn't a good solution. I, th I mostly after that sort of surrendered and I'm just like, okay, I'll do this thing that feels, ultimately it feels bad to me, even though it's like a gesture of um, re reverence or something, people are like putting me on a pedestal of some kind. That's what feels bad to me. I wanna just be like, don't treat me like that. I don't make me write my name on your thing. Just like, uh, let's meet as equals. Maybe it's, I'm too idealistic about it. <laughs> Right. But yeah, so you, I sort of have given up. Yes, yeah, so you, you do sign autographs now, generally. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I'm about to go on tour. And uh, I, I love selling my own merch at the merch table. I don't have a merch person. I just, um, I like to do it. But I'm that's the part of going on tour I'm still a little nervous about in like COVID times, which are maybe wrapping up, but still it's not finished. That's the part where I probably will get sick if I if I'm gonna get sick, and so I feel like signing autographs is I can draw that line. I can be like, no, I'm not gonna. I'm here to like sell records, and that's it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's just an excuse. The truth is that it really does feel weird and bad for me to sign autographs, and I don't like it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I definitely get that. Yeah, it's a. It's such a strange thing. I remember you saying in, in that pamphlet too that you, at one point, your your strategy was just to write your name in block letters on their uh, on their thing, and that people were sometimes put off by that. But that's what an autograph is ultimately. I mean, it's a strange, <laughs> yeah. it's a strange practice that it's people. It's also absurd. Yeah, yeah. Do you take like photos with fans? What's your what's your um, perspective on that? I'm pretty compliant. I'll mm -hmm. pretty much like. 
at least that's my impulse. And my impulse is to be like total surrender of my own like comforts and ideals and sense of what's absurd and what's not absurd. When I'm in that moment, I kind of just have to force myself to swallow it and be like, this person wants a photo with me. Okay. Seems weird, but okay. And, uh, and go with it. But now that I'm saying all this and thinking about, you know, in a couple of weeks when I'm at these big shows, I really want to not get sick so that we don't have to cancel the rest of the tour. So I might be drawing a firmer line about that type of thing. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So as far as your tour, um, this is your first time in, in how long touring is the microphones? It's been over a decade, right? Uh, well, yeah. La last fall, we did a few short tour in Europe. Right. But um, that's true. Yeah, first time since, dude, yeah, almost 20 years. Hmm. Are you going to be playing only microphone songs or do you think you'll sprinkle in Mount Erie as well? No, we're only playing one song, actually. We're playing oh. one, one very long song. Microphones in 2020? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Oh, cool. Wow. Um, what, is, uh, what is your perspective on this, on this tour as a – because – along with this box set is kind of a capstone to the microphone's name. If you're playing this sort of summative song, Microphones of 2020 at these shows, and people are, you know, you're touring around big cities in America, you know, um, with this song, what, what inspired you to feel like this was a time to, to share it in person, if that makes sense? Yeah, it's not really the time. <laughs> 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 um uh, the time would have been maybe like closer to when the album came out which was a while ago now and we did have it planned but it's a tour that got postponed because of the pandemic so this is the time that is available for us and after that i'm going to put it away and yeah i just wanted to do it. it seems fun to me to play this song live and to do these weird shows that are just one huge long song yeah it's, um it's an interesting thing to do, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Do you have the lyrics all memorized to that song? Yeah, I do. Nice. Oh, I hope. Yeah, yeah. We'll find out. You draw a lot of kind of metaphor and, and imagery from uh, from nature. I mean, you live in a, in a more suburban area, right? Is is Anacortes kind of more suburban? Yeah. 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 It's. I wouldn't say it's suburban, but yeah, it's it's rural. Rural. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is your? Do you think that the the song comes first? or that the imagery that inspires the song comes first? Uh, yeah, that nature question is, it's an ongoing uh, thing for me because I'm not trying to like write about nature really. To me, I think it, it's always been that way. Like it, when I look back at those first teenage albums, it was still kind of like that. And I think maybe it was the way I grew up sort of rurally that was just the world it wasn't like my, my background world that I grew up in wasn't parking lots and strip malls it I grew up like you know in the woods on, on lakes and those were that was the version of life on earth that seemed like basic basic background to me so it has never really been an effort to like be naturey it was more just an effort to like write simply about the world in its most basic state um, to, to strip down the distractions of the, like all of the complications of human life to really get at the heart of things. Mm. I'm, I sort of have an aversion to being overly naturey or picturesque because I feel like that can get romantic and miss the point a lot. And so sometimes I push against it and like try to sing about a uh, strip mall or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that's interesting because a lot of your songs, uh, especially with like with newer Mount Erie stuff, but in the early microphones days too, a lot of your songs follow a similar stripped down style where it might just be you with a guitar. But then you also have songs that feature like a lot of distortion and a lot of really heavy uh, instrumentals and especially like the glow part too. Um, what what tells you that uh, like a song needs to have that amount of difference and needs to be less stripped down do you feel like it needs to be or is it does it just hit you yeah it's it's um 
it's an artistic question. It's intuitive. I, I wish I had a better answer than just like, it feels right. But, right, right. but really that's it. It's like making art you go with the feeling. Mm, yeah, for sure. Um, I've always wondered too about a uh, uh, wind's dark poem. What, what kind of inspired that? Cause it feels so much different from your other stuff, but it also feels like mm -hmm. it grew out of your other stuff. Yeah. I was trying to make use sort of the techniques or like the tones of some black metal songs I had heard and to just to like see if I could pull it off to make this like maximal very extremely dense um not it's not I wouldn't call it black metal but it's definitely like aiming for the same things using the same touchstones blast beats and like distorted wind or screaming. I actually didn't scream. I'm not a great screamer, <laughs> but uh, I used a recording of wind, actual wind, and distorted it. So it sort of had the same vibe as like a distorted screaming black metal singer. When you focus on, which this is true for like, I would say most of your work probably, but when you focus on really personal themes and you're talking about real things in your life, how do people in your life who might be, you know, alluded to in the, in the songs or what have you, like react to that? Oh, yeah, I don't know. They, if they, <laughs> if they are offended, they haven't told me. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully it means they're not offended. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> Have you had reactions from say, if you, if you talk about like an ex or if you talk about somebody in your life years ago, have you ever had them reach out to you and be like, wow, I heard this? Yeah, I mean, now I can think, mostly stuff I made when I was much younger, mm. where I was more like dramatic, I guess, or more personal. I feel like I try, oh, no, that's not true. I remember, I mean, it's not like any touchy stuff, but on Microphones in 2020, there's a section where I talk about seeing Bonnie Prince Billy in Italy with his band. And um, that musician, Bonnie Prince Billy, Will Oldham, I sent it to him before I released it. And I was like, I, I mentioned you in my song. I don't, is that okay? And so, yeah, I, I try and run it by people. It was, even if it's like nothing positive or negative was really being said, it was just an observation. Right. It's more just, just seems polite. Yeah, I don't wanna talk about other people if mm -hmm. I don't have to. Yeah, yeah. This is similar to something that I was, I was talking about earlier, but like the, you've said that there are certain things that you haven't wanted to release because you haven't felt like they're, they're done, but has there been anything you haven't wanted to release because it felt like too personal? Yeah, definitely. Um, a crow looked at me when yeah. I recorded those songs. I felt like no way can I release this. This is just like for my own processing or whatever. But then I released it and that was a hard one. I, I went back and forth a lot on that because it just felt like too raw, too intense. Not be, not, I didn't feel like I couldn't release it because um, I was exposing anyone but myself, but more just that it would be, I don't know, too, like an act of violence towards anyone who heard it or something to be confronted with these big feelings, but then, I don't know, I started to think that maybe there were some redeeming, helpful things in it too. Mm. It was, that made it seem worth it. Also, I was just proud of the writing. Oh <laughs> I yeah. Like, <laughs> I thought I like, no, that's good. Yeah, I'm proud of my work. So it, my ego got the best of me, I guess. <laughs> sure, yeah. How do you see that now then? Do you, do you ever look back at that album? I don't listen to it. Sometimes it comes up on shuffle mm. and Ah, maybe like half the time I let it play but half the time I skip it right. if a song comes up but um yeah I, I look back on it as like necessary and strange and I'm I'm glad that I did all of that and had that like I feel like it was helpful for me personally in like a grief way to really feel it because mm -hmm. I know that that's like the path through big hard feelings is like not ignoring them. And so singing these songs and going on tour and, and like talking to people about, about that stuff 
was sort of like a crash course for me in like dealing with it. I don't yeah. think I'm finished, but yeah, it, it w was helpful in that way. Mm, yeah. That seems like it must have been hard in theory to go on tour supporting that album, but you think yeah. it, it was more helpful than, than difficult? Yeah. Yeah, mm. it was it was definitely helpful. It was definitely difficult too. Yeah. Not only that, but I had this young child with me and that had to come. She was too young to, you know, I was a single parent all of a sudden. So just the logistics of doing those tours was really tricky. Getting a nanny that came along and um, it was all new territory for me, like a new way of touring. But yeah, I'm glad it all happened. It all went really well. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, on to something completely different. Um, you're from, or you, you currently live in, um, in Washington, an area that is very well known for its music scene, but in a lot of different ways than necessarily what you produce. Um, I mean, there's the grunge scene, obviously that made Seattle very, you know, desirable. And there's like a more, more recent indie rock scene that also kind of revitalized it. How do you see those scenes? And do you feel like you're, you fit into them at all? Maybe. I I've never really been that comfortable being like fully in a scene because mm. maybe it comes from growing up in a small town that really kind of had no scene. And maybe it's uh, my family culture of like growing up out of town, even though we lived, the town was like a small town. We lived five miles outside of town. So we're just like kind of weirdo um, individualists. <laughs> I inherited that, that stance. So yeah, I like to do my own thing, but I can recognize that I was definitely informed by Nirvana coming out when I was a teenager and the sort of the aesthetic of Northwest kind of grounded, gritty rock music that uh, sort of informed my teenage years a lot, mm. got me into doing this stuff. Um, I, you mentioned like later an indie rock scene in Seattle. I probably was tuned out by then. I don't who who. Well, I'm like thinking Death like for cutie. Yeah, yeah, like Modest Mouse being oh, around okay. there. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, even more recently, like uh, Japanese Breakfast coming out of that area. I don't know if you're familiar with her work. Is she from Seattle? I think she's from that area, right? Or maybe Oregon. Maybe I'm wrong. I think yeah, maybe or maybe Portland. Anyway, yeah. yeah, definitely. That I lived in Olympia, and there was certainly a scene in Olympia scene. Um, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Those microphones albums I made when I lived in Olympia were, um, could only have happened at that time and place. It was, it did sort of feel like a renaissance was happening where there was just like punk shows all over town, multiple uh, record labels, and everyone was just doing stuff. And there were resources and studios and K records and Kill Rock Stars and all, all these things happening. It was um, a really special time. And living there also not having the distractions of the internet uh, or even like tv or you know it was like only focused on making this stuff that was a special occurrence yeah yeah is that that's kind of what inspired you to, to start recording your own stuff you think i was doing it i was doing it before then but mm -hmm. like, as a teenager in anacortes before i moved to olympia but moving to olympia just like ramped way up because i was living living it really i like kind of went to college at evergreen for two quarters but dropped out and just fully devoted to like living cheap in punk houses and recording all the time and going on tour and making just enough money to survive it was mm -hmm. um like all in right right yeah um cool oh yeah so i wanted to ask you actually this is a i mentioned this to my mom and she had this question for you um that the the foghorn tape that you uh -huh. released last year I, I explained the uh you know the process of like you putting that out and uh she was just she wanted to know what what inspired that being released as an album <laughs> um yeah good question i found the so yeah how much background should i give <laughs> Well, as much as you want. I mean, I, I know it's, it came from the glow part too, initially. Right, right? This, yeah. That yeah. when I was mixing or make, finishing up the glow part two in like 2000, 2001, 
I decided that I wanted there to be a consistent background noise for the whole album, just to sort of give, to place the album in, a, in an atmosphere. And honestly, it was inspired by this one scene in Twin Peaks. Are you familiar with that show? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I noticed, I was watching Twin Peaks way back then, and I noticed that whenever they would cut to Pete and Catherine and Josie's house, this is deep, <laughs> deep reference, but there was always this like distant foghorn in the background. It was like the audio signifier, like, oh, we're on the water now. This is, these guys live, maybe it's on a lake or maybe it's salt water, but like, it's just sort of a, such a potent little background noise that it, for me, it signified so much of like what was going on in the weather, what was going on outside of the house. It was, uh, and so I thought I wanted to make my whole album exist with that sort of subtle signifier of the place where it is. And so I made this tape loop of, of uh, a foghorn and it actually wasn't a foghorn. It was a, a note, one note on a bass slowed down and with lots of fuzz. And I just had that playing underneath almost the whole album. And it was on a cassette. I dub, I made a tape loop and then fill the cassette tape with it and then last year or the year before when I was cleaning out my archives I found that that tape and I was like oh that's cool that would be good as <clears throat> as just a tape to listen to it's nice and like ambient and it's sort of like the glow part two but without all the songs right. it's like just <laughs> just the background and so yeah I pressed this sort of novelty record of a thousand copies of just background noise just for fun, kind of as a joke, but also not as a joke because I do like how it sounds. Right, right. That's yeah. the story. Have you, have you, uh, has that type of, I mean, you've had similar stuff where it's been sort of ambient and less about the songs in the past, but is that something that you'd ever, you ever feel like you'd pursue more? Yeah, definitely. I always want to actually. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> almost always my intention is to make records like that. And then inevitably, this itch of like, ah, oh, well, it's, I gotta say something. <laughs> I, it's gotta be about something. I have to communicate, that's important. I don't wanna just make like filler, but um, yeah, I, that's the type of music I mostly listen to yeah. is that type of thing. So yeah, we'll see. Sure, yeah. Speaking of which, uh, what do you what do you tend to listen to? What have you been listening to lately? Do you have uh, any artists that are really hitting you recently? No, I, lately I've been trying to pare down my record collection. So I've been going through the vinyl with like a because I moved recently and so there's like less shelf space. Yeah. So I need to get rid of some records to fit them all on the shelves. So I'm going through the collection really critically and being like, oof, this one doesn't make the cut. It's, so it's not, uh, it's mostly like a very critical judgmental ear that I've been listening to. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> yeah, just being honest with myself. Like, I'm not going to listen to that one anymore. Once is enough. Right, right. So you're trying to listen to less music almost. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, is, uh, I guess, I guess maybe this, maybe this question doesn't even mean anything then but are there artists right now that uh that you have been listening to or like current artists yeah well this tour we're about to do is the west coast is with this band ragana and they're awesome and then the midwest and east coast is with emily sprague who is also i'm a big fan of i'm really excited for those shows okay a couple a couple uh sort of rapid fire questions to to kind of cap us off here um do you prefer this might actually not be a rapid fire this might be much deeper but do you prefer mount erie or the microphones no <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a good answer um favorite musician of all time <laughs> no i'm sorry i'm, I'm just gonna <laughs> be so bad at this because like my daughter is seven and she she's always like dad what's your favorite dessert or and I'm just like <laughs> I have this inability to answer any favorite questions really? or like ranking things it's like almost pathological I can't um 
I can't impose hierarchies. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a, a better way to process things, I feel like, you know, I almost wish I didn't have favorites and least favorites. Well, I feel like it's, for me at least, it feels like f fake because it's yeah. all just shifting all the time. Maybe at the moment I could decide that this is my favorite, but uh, I know that I'll feel different tomorrow or maybe even five minutes from now. So Yeah, yeah, true, yeah. So you don't have, is there any question that has favorite in it that you could answer? <laughs> <laughs> I I would need to work hard. I feel like I should probably like, sit for hours with yeah. like a pen and paper and answer that question and really so I could remember like oh yeah that is my favorite movie or that's my favorite band or whatever I mean often I have go-to's like I often say that my favorite band is Eric's Trip from uh since I was a teenager because they made such an impact on me and sort of sc sculpted the like aesthetic direction of so much of my creative life and that remains true it's not that like i listen to their albums and i'm like hell yeah this is the best music ever recorded still i i i don't sometimes i listen to their albums and i'm like ah. <laughs> but you know what i mean so yeah, like, favorite yeah. is such a troublesome idea yeah that's true that's true everything maybe just has a has its merit in equal and different ways yeah. yeah it's like a frustratingly like zenned out answer for <laughs> for this simple question yeah well i guess it's not that simple of a question I, I put it at the end to uh to rapid fire it but i guess in a way it is the most complex <laughs> yeah some people just have that decided you know but. right no i don't that's that's where the pathological part of my brain comes in like i'm resistant to ever having it decided because <laughs> to me it deciding it means like closing the door to all other things mm. and i that's the opposite of what i want in life do you think that's kind of connected to like you were saying before how you even when you think something's not totally done you put it out yeah yeah totally definitely it's i don't know it's everything is fluid even after something is released to go back to that question I notice that I tend to kind of return to it sometimes and fuss around with the mixes and maybe release a different version that's like just the organs from this song or, you know, I, when something is released, it's still not finished for me. It's just like, that's the version that was done then. And then when I play it live, it's like a whole other version. So I, I enjoy sort of emphasizing the uh, permeability of all this mm. stuff. Yeah, like the idea that nothing is ever really done. Yeah, which is true. This. It's mm -hmm. like a, a true fact. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, that's all that I've got. So it's been a pleasure. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to plug beyond the tour and the, the box set? That's it. No, nope. cool. thanks for having me. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming on. I'll see, yeah. you, see you in March, I suppose. Okay, see you. Bye. All right, bye.